Hi, welcome to this regular school committee meeting of January 25th, 2024. Um, we don't have any uh, public comment or AHS representatives, so we can start. And we also welcome Ms. Keys, who is our AES representative. Um, so we can actually start right in with the vote to approve application for rebate for electric bus, which is being presented by uh, Ms. Talia Fox from the town, and she's on Zoom, so we need to be able to see Zoom people. <coughs> Okay, she knows she's being promoted, so hmm? I said she knows she's being promoted on Zoom. Okay, Ms. Fox, can you hear us? Oh, your microphone is muted, at least from this side. Ms. Fox? Her. Yep, there she is. Okay, there we go. Hi there. Can I turn this down? I can't hear anybody. I can hear yeah. you. Can you hear us? You can't hear us, Talia? You can't hear us, Talia. Okay, got it. Okay. She can hear us now. Hello, can you hear us now? Yes, I Okay. Okay. So we are. Uh, since you missed, we are ready to vote to approve the application for the rebate for electric bus. If you could just tell us real quickly what it's about. Yeah, certainly. So, um, this is an application for the Queen School Bus Rebate Program. Um, it's also, I'm calling it Fox. Let me I can't hear you. One second, but um, uh, I'm just going to search the account. Um, the Queen School Bus Rebate Program is a federal funding initiative run by the EPA. And the application requires that I take a form signed by an authorized um, school district representative, basically acknowledging that the school committee was informed about the application, the number of buses, and the fuel type of the buses, as well as who will own the buses. Um, and I'm planning to apply for funds to support one electric bus to replace a diesel bus in the school suite. The school would own the bus. Um, I'm not planning to apply for funding for charging infrastructure um, because the school transportation director has. Oh, great, I can see you on this. Um, the Why school transportation so director has informed me that an additional bus Kids could be located look. on the chargers at Audison. That's where the exists over there. The maximum funding amount is $200,000 for the rebate, and we have. 150,000 in the FY25 capital budget to replace the diesel bus. 
this amount would not be sufficient for an electric vehicle, which is why I am seeking additional funds. Given the, the towns and the school schools, um, zero, it's crucial that as these opportunities arise to eliminate the use of fossil fuels and then my solution in the community would be my best to take advantage of opportunities. So it does feel important to mention that the likelihood of us securing this rebate, rebate is quite small. We are not a prioritized community because we don't meet certain environmental justice criteria that the federal government is using to allocate funds. Um, and I'll do my best to seek additional funding sources so that we aren't forced to purchase a diesel bus in the new fiscal year. Um, so with all that said, I, I just ask for your blessing for this application. I'm happy to answer any quick questions, but um, I don't think there's a ton of time right now and I'm happy to come back to the committee and have a, a lengthier discussion about some of the climate um, initiatives that we have going on. And uh, I do plan to come back in the coming weeks. So thanks. Great, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, can someone make a motion? So moved. Um, second. Second, uh, any further discussion? <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, that's great. So we'll sign it, and uh, I think Liz Diggins will have it after this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great night. Oh, okay. now you sound great. Okay. So <clears throat> next we have the Hardy Improvement Plan. Um, you want to yes, say anything first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why. Right. While they get set up. Um, I just want to say a few quick words. First of all, a big thank you to Dr. Connolly, who's a new principal in the Arlington Public Schools and stepped in as interim principal at Hardy during a late transition of their principal last year. Um, I want to thank Dr. Connolly for all the work you've done to support the Hardy community this year, especially. Um, notable is the work that our special educators in the SLCC program have done with some new staff um, and the support that the community has really gotten from your leadership. Dr. Connolly told us recently she won't be applying to the permanent position. Um, and while we're sad to say goodbye, we're very grateful for her leadership and also for the leadership of Ms. Tatsoulis, who has been the assistant principal there for quite a while. I'm excited for them to share some of the great work they have going on at Hardy this year. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Connolly. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. Holm. First of all, uh, Dr. Holm, I thank you as well for your support and um, everyone here at the table support in my role here. It's been an incredible opportunity and as my, in my professional journey. Um, I've learned a tremendous amount. It's been really nice being back into schools with students, so I've really enjoyed the opportunity. Um, I'd also like to take the time to thank the, the educators um, at the Hardy School, who it's just been tremendous to work with them, um, consummate professionals, um, and really uh, have students uh, at the center. And, and as Dr. Homan spoke, uh, the SLC programs at the school have really done well, so I want to thank Allison for her support in, in our continued efforts to improve those programs and all opportunities for all students. So uh, to everyone uh, at the Hardy School and families, but most in particular the students who have uh, just really warmed my heart uh, tremendously to be, as I said, back in, the, back in schools and every day being with students. So it's been a tremendous opportunity. Uh, so tonight I just want to talk about um, uh, the Hardy numbers, um, our priorities, areas, and then answer any questions that you may have for us. Um, so the Hardy School, um, our initial vision from 1925 um, was hand, heart, mind um, for the common good, and the Hardy community sort of took that on as an initiative last year and has really solidified it this year, um, working with the students and the families and came up with safe, kind, and responsible, which is really reflective of the work that we do um, in, the, in our goals, in our uh, positive behavior program. So those are really the goals that we work with the students on. Um, last year we had Eight, uh, 383 students and 49 staff. We're up a couple of students and a couple of staff this year um, and the staff um, increases due to some of our special education needs. Um, the race and ethnicity of Hardy School has remained relatively steady. We have seen a drop in our um, African American black population. Um, this is just for two, year, two years ago, it was 3.2. Um, in part, that is due to Boston resident students um, working closely with the MECO director to see if we can't get those numbers up, as we'll have just one student that resides in Boston at the Hardy School next year, and we want to certainly um, at least some sort, supply some sort of a cohort for them. The strategic goals were in your packets, um, and they're here. 
Um, some will be familiar. I, I also want to thank my principal colleagues at this time as I'm doing this as uh, they've been an incredible team um, to me as I've done this work, um, not this work here, but just be, being here in Arlington. It's a, it's a really great um, group of administrators that I've had the privilege of, of collaborating with. So now we're going to talk about MCAS and although it's in your, it's in your report, but not on, um, not on the slides or the MCAS numbers for mathematics. I just want to talk about those as an aggregate. The data indicate that the Hardy School um, has met and in some areas exceeded the state determination goals in both achievement and growth. Um, while this is something we take pride in, our instructional leadership team and I hold responsibility to further disaggregate this data, identify students performing below expectations, notably students that are in a high need category. My team and I are responsible for exploring those factors that have contributed to and continue to contribute to considerably lower achievement score for these children compared to the classmates and focus our efforts on closing those gaps through differentiated instructions, interventions, and responsive teaching processes. While 36% of our test takers did not meet grade level expectations, which is certainly a concerning number, 74% did. Um, we must balance our concern for meeting the needs of our high need students in mathematics while ensuring that implement rigorous and relevant content. I'm going to move to ELA, which is on these slides. Um, and again, as an aggregate data, um, the Hardy School has met and in some areas have exceeded state determination goals, both in achievement and in growth. While this is a positive reflection on the dedicated staff and students of our community, uh, it's, um, it is my instructional responsibility and that of our instructional leadership team to further disaggregate this data. Uh, that said, the data indicate that our high need students um, earned two of the possible eight achievement points and six of the possible growth points. Um, and so therefore we are, it's a, a continued area of worry and concern and focus for us. I think another thing that the ILT this year has really been able to do um, along with some of the changes that we've made with our, um, uh, with our weekly meetings, with our ACE meetings, is that we've, every meeting, it's an expectation of the team to bring da student data to the meetings, and we're looking at that student data and then making recommendations for interventions. We're following the interventions on a weekly basis. Um, certainly we have six to eight week cycles, but on a weekly basis we're talking about what those might look like and how we can um, make sure that we're doing targeted uh, research-based interventions for all of our students. Um, Part of that too is also we're looking to shift our ownership of learning from teacher to the student, which is one of the EL initiatives. Um, and some of these areas that we've really looked at across our whole school is learning targets, as EL uh, is as EL refers to them. Um, we would know them more familiar as learning objectives um, and total participation total participation techniques. It's sort of a new language that goes along with EL. And those are things that will also be familiar to you. Those are things like um, uh, turn and talk, a thumb <coughs> meter, true false hold ups, using whiteboards to see, check for understanding. Um, but you're doing it the, with the whole class at the same time so that then you can get immediate feedback to alter your instruction that's happening. Um, the existing literacy gaps between the high needs and non high needs students. Um, uh, continue to be addressed, as I said, through consistent implementation in part by, uh, by the, EL, the new EL curriculum um, and by providing targeted evaluative and non-evaluative instructional feedback for our teachers um, and as well as, as I said, the targeted um, interventions and the support of our, uh, of our curriculum coaches. So our next data we're looking at um, up here is our data on um, our SEL. Uh, we believe that improving belonging for all students is defined and understood as a person, supported by as adults, respected by other students, and having a general feeling of belonging. Uh, so we, along with the district, has, have taken this initiative on full force. One of the significant things that we did was in the beginning of the year, right in the first couple of days of school, um, Peggy and I um, put together a, a, a whole document and presentation and we had teachers and custodians and anyone that any of the educators in our building sign up to, to be a partner with a student. Um, some people, not many, but some people chose as many as three and the job of that person was to make a further connection with that student whether they're on their way to lunch, they stop in the cafeteria, say hello to them, if they stay in the hall, they make a, a concerted effort to reach out to that student. Um, which I think that has made a big deal. And people took this and were very excited about the opportunity. Uh, you know, teachers that had stu particular students couldn't wait and to, to make those connections. And every student in the school has somebody um, or even two people that are 
uh, connected to them. And what we'll do is in a couple of months, we will do a, an event in which those folks will be able to work with those, with those folks outside of the, um, the, co the content areas. Um, in addition, we brought back all school meetings. So we have a monthly all school meetings um, in which the fifth grade leaders of our school uh, sort of run the meeting. They read a book that has to do with belonging. Um, we do a, a, a birthday pencil handout and a big yell for happy birthday. The Hardy Husky sometimes makes a surprise visit. Um, and we do a whisper hearty cheer that is um, become beloved and they can't wait to do the whisper, give me an H, um, hearty chair. Um, but I think that it's really a credit to the faculty that we went up 12 percentage points in our most recent um, panorama data on the sense of belonging for our students. And it's, it's just a concerted effort by the, the, all the employees of the Hardy School that have made this, ha made this possible. <clears throat> Um, strategic fa uh, family engagement goal, um, improve the belonging for all families. I think one of the things that um, I certainly recognized in my career over the last number of days as we went through the collective COVID is that it was, we were slow to get folks back in, um, both for folks wanting to volunteer and just even feeling some trepidation around allowing folks to come in. So I think that we started this before I came, but this year we've um, brought back a number of uh, community events. Um, we've done the Harvest Fest, we've had Trunk or Treat, we've had picnics, we've had a craft day. We were gonna have a movie night, but it conflicts with basketball, so we're gonna put that off a little bit. Um, but we, there's been a number of things that the, we've worked in collaboration with the PTO, who've also been amazingly um, supportive of our teachers um, in the community to bring back that whole idea of um, the idea, you know, the elementary school is such a you know, part of the ethos of, uh, of the neighborhoods and having neighborhood schools lends itself to that. And one of the things that we've seen is a, a much more significant outpouring, even in the last short order, of folks wanting to come in and volunteer and be in the library and be readers and even come and say, we'll make copies for you. So it's been um, really great. And I think that the community has now beginning to feel, we have a big event on, uh, Tuesday morning for our kindergartners, um, they're be making, a, they're doing a, they're all doing um, uh, presentations and they're doing a gallery walk with families. So if you're not doing anything at nine o'clock on Tuesday morning, you can come on by and uh, see some of the EL work actually uh, in in progress. And part of that is them presenting their work, and they're quite articulate and it's and it's pretty wonderful. In addition. Um, we're in the process of getting, getting gathering nominations for a school council. We've not had a school council in a little bit. Um, the PTO is helping me with this. We do have a number of folks that are uh, interested, and we're hoping to hold nominations probably right after February break. Just we're just going to we're in the process of working on it. Um, one of the things that I've done as well is I've increased my meeting time with the PTO. So I, aside from just the monthly meeting, I'm holding two additional meetings in the mornings right when school starts. Um, because I just felt like it was important to get their voices. Um, they're so generous with their time and, and their resources that I felt like it was really important for me as I onboarded, certainly, but I would, I would um, also suggest that it's been beneficial to the school to have those more frequent meetings. Um, then um, our areas of focus. So um, attendance, belonging, transitions. Attendance continues to be an area of concern for the Hardy School. Um, I think that as I... Um, you know, we're working with the school nurse, we're working with, uh, we, had, we had eight students leave yesterday with fevers. Um, nobody tested positive for COVID. Um, and so it's just one of those things. But I also think that um, at the elementary level, I think that there's a little bit more of a sense that it's okay if someone leaves, we'll, it's okay if we take vacation a couple of days early, it's okay if we, um, if my student, it's gonna be okay, they're in elementary school. And so really I feel like it's an opportunity to educate families that, you know, when you miss 18 days, it's a, you know, it's a 10th of your school year. And it is really critical. It's, we, I completely understand that it's, you need the need to maybe go away a day early or, um, or, you know, you have family things that come up, but really it's really important to be in school particularly. Um, you know, just given our most recent history. So um, we have letters going out, we have communications going out from teachers, we have meetings with families, and so again, I think it's just an opportunity for us to educate folks on how critical it is um, for to get their kids, even, even their littlest kids, in. Um, and so with that, again, I just uh, much appreciation for this last many months. I still have five months, so, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, it's, it's been great. So just if you have any questions, and uh, Peggy and I are happy to answer anything you might have. Okay. I just want to add a look. Dr. Connolly didn't highlight this because it's new data, and Mr. Coleman's going to talk a little bit more about our panorama results. But on the spring panorama survey, um, Hardy saw a 12-point uh, jump in belonging. Um, and I would credit that directly to some of the initiatives that they've had going on. 
and a 15 point jump in questions like uh, what kind of support do you get from adults in your school, which can look directly at some of those initiatives she was describing around connecting adults to students so that they have a trusted adult in the school. So kudos um, to the work that you've done this year. It's already showing some pretty strong results. Great. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Schultzman. Uh, <clears throat> first, Dr. Connolly, thank you for uh, sharing your talent and your experience in caring with us for a year in, in this interim assignment. Uh, the community, I'm sure, appreciates that. <clears throat> and I uh, wish you well as you wander off where wherever you want to be, and I hope for a lot of success. Uh, thank you for the thoughtful presentation. I, 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 I'm curious, uh, that taking a look at the growth numbers, grade four to grade five, uh, grade five is blowing the doors off the gro uh, growth numbers, grade four isn't mm -hmm. uh, particularly over in math. So do you have any sense of why so, uh, you know, elementary schools are greatly impacted by cohorts, um, and I think that this particular grade was also great, more greatly impacted by COVID. And so, I think that we've had this when you look when we look at scores, n not just MCAS scores, but other um, other uh, points of data, including our Dibbles reading scores over time. This group mm -hmm. um, has. Uh, necessitated and secured significant amounts of intervention just due to their need. Um, and so that continues um, to where it's certainly a focus of us right now. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is, you know, even as we prepare for MCAS, and I mean that loosely, but uh, is helping students to become more familiar with the devices that they'll be assessed on, right? So mathematics is on a computer. So we're having students start to work on the mm -hmm. computer to do their mathematics the, and adapting the curriculum to be able to do that a little bit and working with our math coach. So it's somehow sometimes cohorts and particularly in smaller elementary schools um, are, are, they are, have the you know personality of their own like each school um, and needs of their own and this has been a focus for this school for uh, since these folks were in COVID and then beyond so um, it's I can't say that it's all of that I think can't say that it, I can't point to COVID and that's the reason why because we have other groups as you said the fifth grade scores and the third grade scores wouldn't um, don't reflect that, but um, we are certainly aware and um, are focusing much of our attention on that. So all, all I need to know. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. your presentation. Okay. So <coughs> next we have the Bishop School Improvement Plan. All right, while Ms. Liner and Ms. Spinney come up and figure out how to pull your slides up. Yeah, <laughs> let me know if you get stuck. Um, Ms. Liner and Ms. Spinney have been the uh, team at Bishop for this school year and a, good, and a good portion of last school year. If you'll recall, Ms. Liner stepped in as interim principal last school year about mid-year. Ms. Spinney came back to join us after being the AP at Stratton for a little while. Um, and I just want to point out some great work that's been done at Bishop improving meeting structures, conducting meaningful professional development, and very purposefully planned professional development as part of their building meetings this school year. Uh, Ms. Liner was integral in the rollout of a PBIS process at when she was the assistant principal there, and I know that that's ongoing into the school year. It's always a wonderful community to visit with a very vibrant and involved um, parent community, and I look forward to hearing what they have to share with us tonight and what they've been up to. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. And thank you all for um, having us here tonight. We appreciate being here. Um, and we're looking forward to discussing the accomplishments and school priorities. Um, I feel very fortunate to be the principal of the Bishop School and would like to introduce a few people who have joined me here tonight. This is Erin Spinney, our assistant principal, who you'll hear from in a moment. Um, I also have Maria Mato here. She is our literacy coach and Emily Veter, our math coach, and in the back, <laughs> Mary Perry, who is our PTO president um, and is also one of our community members um, on our PBIS team. So thank you for having us all here tonight. So tonight we'll be highlighting some of Bishop's data from last year. Um, we will also uh, be stating our school improvement goals, discussing some of our important priorities for this year and looking ahead to Bishop's future for the next few years. 
Um, to start with, Bishop is a wonderful school with just under 400 students and over 60 staff members in a pr proud Metco school. I started at Bishop School, as um, Dr. Holman said, um, as the first assistant principal five years ago, and last year I became the interim uh, principal in November. As far as initiating any new priorities last year, that really wasn't my role as interim principal. Um, my go goals were to ensure that students and staff felt a sense of security mm -hmm. um, and that the previous principal's priorities were supported. As I said many times, I wanted to make sure that the ship kept sailing in the right direction and with such a supportive and strong staff and caring community of families, we did just that. So to look at some of the data, um, this slide shows our student enrollment demographics. While most of our demographic data percentages are just slightly smaller than the districts, um, the Bishop community has representation from many different countries with 15% of our students with their language, uh, first language, not English. Um, our ML population mm -hmm. is nearly twice that of the districts. Last year, we gained an additional ML teacher, which has been pivotal in really supporting um, our growing ML population. Over the summer, we asked our families, which you can see the picture in the middle, we asked our families to tell us their countries of origin, um, and we made a display of the flags of all the countries that represent the many families that responded. We have 67 flags displayed currently, and we will continue to ask families each year to update our display as needed. So the next slide goes into our MCAS data. Um, I am very proud of the Bishop's um, data, we'll say. Mm -hmm. Our MCAS uh, scores last year showed great growth and achievement. Our accountability rating was 96% which indicates that 91% of our students met or exceeded the standard in grades three to five. Um, I attribute this excellent score to the high quality instruction of outstanding educators, um, each, you know, who are delivering instruction each day. Our coaching model, these two, um, that support uh, instructional practices in the classroom and um, help to give teachers uh, tools that they can use with children in the classroom. We have quality paraprofessionals who support individual students every single day in the classrooms and a rigorous RTI process that helps to find out and support the individual needs of students who may be struggling. Um, and lastly, and probably most importantly, we have supportive families that work very closely with the schools. So we're looking forward to see how our new ELA curriculum will affect our ELA scores, particularly for our high needs population with the um, you know, upcoming rollout. So um, this, this slide, uh, it was interesting to be able to look at some cohort data. Um, so this takes a, a closer look at our math MCAS data and looks how fifth graders from last year did over the past three years. So the scores, um, the scores themselves are grouped by grade level. So by looking at the 2021 third grade data, 2022 fourth grade data, and then the 2023 fifth grade data, you can look at the cohort of students to observe how the gap between non-high needs and high needs students changed over three years. So I'm very pleased to share with a, a very focused effort um, that the gap decreased from 15 to 6 to 2 percent over the three years at Bishop with that particular group of students. Um, because of the pandemic, we don't have other cohort data to look at, but we will sort of continue to look at these type of trends um, with particular groups of students in the coming years. So now Ms. Finney is going to speak um, about our school improvement goals. Good evening. Uh, the first goal will address the achievement gap and literacy between high needs and non high needs <coughs> students. We're really excited about, excited about implementing the new curriculum. We found that the former curriculum left a little to be desired when it came to our students with high needs. Uh, EL is more inclusive and allows for more discussion among students, which increases their deeper understanding. Uh, 
uh, not only are we implementing foundations integrity in the classroom, but our tier one, uh, tier two, and tier three instructors are giving students a double dose when appropriate, which not only furthers their understanding, but makes them feel more comfortable uh, to participate in the classroom. Our uh, next goal, this next goal, we will be focusing on increasing tier one instruction and student engagement by implementing EL, high level uh, leverage <coughs> instructional practices across the curriculum. We have focused on uh, this within our instructional leadership team. Our members are taking risks in implementing new protocols. Uh, they are welcoming their peers to come in and observe lessons in their classroom, uh, which you know allows for opening themselves up to feedback. And I have to say, I've really been impressed with the Bishop School. We have new or newer teachers to Bishop um, that are excited about jumping in to something new, and they're taking some risks. But we also have many of our seasoned teachers diving into new protocols and promoting academic discourse. Uh, not only in ELA, but in all the curricular areas, which has been really impressive to see. Uh, our third goal is focusing on culture and climate, and we will be working to improve belonging for all students. Again, through our instructional leadership team, we are working with the director of the DEIBJ, Margaret Creedle Thomas, to learn how to appropriately and effectively uh, conduct empathy interviews in hopes to gather more information about how to improve belonging for all students. Uh, this last goal is all about improving belonging for all families. We are taking more steps to reach out to families and uh, about their child's academic progress and trying to establish uh, stronger communication channels. And Mrs. Leonard will be talking more about this shortly. <coughs> All right, um, I'm sure those goals looked very familiar to you now that we've had many elementary schools come through. We, as um, Mitch stated, we, we've worked together on those and it was a very great process. Um, so as far as academic um, and instructional priorities, um, as you've likely heard from my colleagues in the other elementary schools, one of our priori priorities is continue to look closely at our early literacy data, including Dibble Screener, to identify students who need more intensive tier one and tier two supports. We use time in our weekly meetings to discuss the most effective interventions, leaning on our reading department and instructional literacy coach. And then our classroom teachers and reading teachers do an outstanding job in the large group instruction and giving students exactly what they need to support their areas of growth. Um, our displayed Dibble, uh, Dibble's data demonstrates the effectiveness of our literacy programming and de decreasing the number of students who are below and well below the standard after kindergarten. Another priority connected to this, um, sorry. Uh, another con con uh, priority connected to this goal is to increase our protocols and academic discourse strategies. Um, as teachers learn more tools, they are getting more comfortable utilizing these high, highly engaging practices and are see seeing important results in the student work. For example, last year at a summative meeting that I had with a teacher, she mentioned that her students' written essays were better than in previous years. And I asked her why she thought there was a change. And she attributed um, the growth, uh, the growth in her students to her growing use of discourse, particularly around pre-writing and particularly with her high needs <clears throat> students. So when having more time to discuss their ideas and importantly hear other classmates' ideas, they were all better able to express their thoughts in writing. So my hope is that when we fully implement the EL curriculum, um, which is rich in discourse, we will continue to see this level of improvement in written expression. It's okay. Okay. Um, so as far as the culture and climate priorities, um, in an effort to increase student belonging, um, particularly for those students in our focal groups, coupled with the fact that there have been leadership changes um, over the past year, um, Ms. Finney and I worked with Margaret Creedle Thomas um, and Mogley Olander, the SEL director, to create a PD series around building trust, 
building belonging, and making connections with our work with students and families. This three-session PD is just the beginning of what I hope to be a multi-year uh, series. This is not the kind of work that's ever done, so we will continue to collaboratively plan to build on our learning each year. Additionally, as Ms. Finney mentioned earlier, I, our ILT is getting empathy interview training to be able to skillfully conduct empathy interviews with selected students and families. Our hope is to analyze the data in a longitudinal study where we are asking the same students and families questions over a number of years. Um, and we'll use this data in addition to other qualitative data like the panorama survey to better understand their experiences and make important adjustments to our programming as needed. And lastly, in this priority area, um, as Dr. Holman mentioned, we will continue our thriving PBIS, PBIS system. We have um, clear school-wide behavioral expectations that teachers reinforce in their classroom and a, a very thriving acknowledgement system where students earn blue Bishop Bear tickets um, for demonstrating one of our three core values, respect, responsibility, or regard for others. We have clear signage through the school and have different all school activi activities and challenges like earning a certain number of tickets in a category like regard in order to earn uh, all school pajama day or having a teacher march madness bracket to acknowledge the participation of our excellent staff. One piece of panorama data that's kind of small on that so slide. Um, in the area of school climate was how positive or negative is the energy in your school. And we had an increase in that last year, and I believe one of the reasons we made gains in the area is because we had a full year experience of PBIS last year for the first time. So the last priority is family engagement. And uh, Bishop, Bishop has rich traditions and family events that are a huge part of what, what makes Bishop a special school and I have hugely appreciated the collaboration and supportive spirit of our PTO in the past and even more recently as I transitioned to be principal. Um, increasing participation in the many events like the Bishop Play, Bear Fair, Science Night and the Cultural Fest is one of the important tasks that we have ahead. We're also looking to add more family engagement activities, like the principal's meet and greets that Ms. Benny and I have started this year, and a math event for families that's currently being planned. Additionally, since the pandemic, there really has not been a concerted effort to address chronic absenteeism. So this year, Ms. Benny and I, in collaboration with classroom teachers, are in greater communication with families around excessive absences and are committed to raising awareness and working with families to move forward with this work. I will also collaborate with my principal and assistant principal colleagues to learn more about effective mechanisms that they've used to increase attendance. So the last slide is around just Bishop's future. So um, there are a few things I wanted to highlight from this, but uh, some of the areas we plan to build upon in the next few years, um, we're looking to increase our social work in the building to be more in line with the other elementary schools so that we can provide tier one and tier two supports for children. Um, we want to continue our equity PD work with our staff. Um, we need to focus greatly on the ways we can support staff and the EL implementation through ACE meetings and other PD time. Um, looking to add new technology like audio systems in the classroom to p bring up our technology to be in par with newer schools, newer than Bishop, um, or new, more newly renovated than Bishop. And also to have more interdisciplinary and innovative experiences for children by increasing our gardening program. So I appreciate your attention and um, listening to our presentation. And if you have any questions, we're happy to talk about Bishop Moore. Great. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Carden. Uh, thanks. And uh, sort of relates to the to uh, Hardy as well. Thank you for for ramping up 
community engagement and involvement of families. How are, how are people reacting to that? Are you getting good attendance at these events? Yes. Um, some of the events are brand new, and so it's hard to gauge mm -hmm. whether or not. So as I, I said, um, Ms. Binning and I have had principal meet and greets. We never had that before when I was an assistant principal, so it's hard to gauge, but I will say they've been consistently attended by different families, so it's not that the same people are coming every time, so that's been positive. And some of the new events that we have are upcoming, mm -hmm. so I'll be able to report more on that later. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've got the same fourth, fifth grade thing working, too. I'm wondering if there's something systemic about our curriculum or something going on around the district. Uh, or is this just sort of a quirk that the two the two of you guys are encountering the same little growth number? I, yeah. I'm going to chime in on his question because I was going to ask the same thing. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah. I wonder if it's because of COVID, uh, well, because of the age. That's of what the I was going to address. COVID. <clears throat> yeah. So the students who, <clears throat> so we're talking about the f students who were in fourth grade last year, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. So our current fifth graders yeah. were in first second grade, some of the real foundational times, particularly for literacy. And I think um, we can all agree that COVID was unprecedented. We didn't always have all the, you know, mm -hmm. proper supports in place um, in that sort of remote and hybrid setting. So I would attribute a lot of that. I think my colleague had, had mentioned that as well. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I, uh, any any one of my team can chime in on any any other thoughts around a discrepancy. I mean, it's just sort of interesting. In but with with the knowledge that every kid who was a fifth grader last year was in the same cohort and ran through the same thing. So, yeah. One you know, I, un, under, and I want to underline that I'm not concerned uh, because you're you're hitting a 96 percentile score, which means you're you're knocking the score the scores out of the park. And to have high achieving, high growth kids like Bishop obviously does is a wonderful thing. Uh, that said, you come in here doing wonderful things. I want to extract that and spread it around the district. Right. So the other thing that I just thought of mm -hmm. um, prior to you speaking was that that, uh, that our current fifth grade group is a large class. So our school has three sections mm -hmm. per grade. That grade has four, mm -hmm. and I believe that that large trend is across the district in our fifth grade. Good luck to okay. Gibbs when they all <laughs> come yeah, next yeah. year. Um, and so I do think there's also, there's a little bit of numbers mm -hmm. in that too, that we have more in that cohort. And, and at the end of your report, you were talking about all these needs for professional development. You're working very hard on professional development, and I admire you and your staff for wanting to go in that direction. Do you have enough time? Do you have enough ability? I, I don't want to see you guys get buried in all the enthusiasm and, and just sort of burn out either. I think that there's always the balance, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of things that need to get done, particularly with a new curriculum being rolled out as mm -hmm. well to the full school next year. So it's going to be about balancing all those priorities and keeping in really great communication with our coaches and our teachers to make sure that what we're doing is matching what they're needing and making adjustments as needed. Uh, but some of the equity work is just work that we have to continue to do. So we have to prioritize in some way. You're speaking well for your school and the district. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Mr. Freeman. Thanks very much for both presentations. Both schools talked about attendance, and uh, I'm just wondering, when you uh, talk to individual students and their families about attendance issues, without getting into a specific case, what are you sure. kind of what are you hearing from them? It's it's <clears throat> there's so many different reasons for um, excessive absences. Uh, there's medical issues. There's um, Traveling, as I said, we have a number of families are, who are international. And, you know, if you travel to India, you're not going for a long weekend, right? You're mm -hmm. going to be gone for a few weeks. And so between, you know, every situation is a bit unique. And I think that part of our work this year is to have those conversations and start gaining that understanding of, okay, what's going on with all our families? And then we can start really catering the needs. It, 
truly at, at elementary level, it's 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 a fan, absenteeism is a family thing, right? Oh, kids mm -hmm. kids get driven to school or they walk to school with their families. So we don't really speak with kids about absenteeism as much as with parents. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, I'm going to circle back to the current fifth graders and this isn't so much for you but rather more for the district that just the little bits of data that we've been seeing just tonight suggest that those kids are still behind or at least certainly the high needs kids in that cohort are behind and I'm just hoping that as we go as they all go to Gibbs that we're ready for them and we need to continue closing those gaps because that's concerning um, no matter what the source is you know we, we have to be working towards uh, mm -hmm. getting them up to speed mm -hmm. the same speed that everyone else is going so thank you very much I appreciate your thank you presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so next we have the AHS program of study uh, dr. Do you want me to change mr. This? McCarthy yeah can you hit escape the program of studies is on this computer if you wanted to pull it up. Do you want me to open it? That's fine. Um, you can leave it right there, Eva. Yeah. Oh, is that it? Yeah, that's it. But just leave it that way. That's it. If you need to scroll through it, you can. If you don't need to, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah, Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How's everyone doing tonight? Good. Good Bill. <laughs> well, it's that time of year again. <laughs> Program of studies time. Um, we saw, I saw Dr. Janger here earlier. Is he gone now? I can oh, hear him. He's out there. Okay. Sorry, they were asking, does somebody want to let the mouse take and walk out through the high school? I think setting up the alarm. Okay. I was like, I could let you out, but I think I'm on camera. <laughs> So as you can see, we have the program of studies here. I believe it was sent out to everyone. Um, quick structural piece just before we get into any of the updates for this next year. Um, the opening page, if you notice at the bottom of the opening page, it says updates specific to 2024 and 2025. Um, that lists all of our new courses, course changes. Um, and so that is helpful uh, as a link. I believe that was all shared with everyone, and that's what I'm going to be working from right now. Uh, also, the table of contents, and uh, this is for anyone who is listening, the, um, everything here is bookmarked and linked, so that's really going to be your home page when you're trying to explore different departments and different course materials and policies. So I'm going to run through the updates and new courses. Uh, if there are questions, I'm obviously I'm open to them. Uh, policy and general information updates. So the first one you'll see there is a department name change. So originally uh, our English Learner Education Department uh, will be changing their name to the Multi-Language Learner Education and that is obviously to foster the fact that many of our students are learning multiple languages or have already mastered several languages. Uh, to match that change we will be taking several of the courses uh, which are currently listed as WIDA 1, WIDA 2 and we will be changing their numbers and their titles. Uh, that's included in the chart below, and I'll point that out as we get there. Um, grade scale update. So the grade scale, this is not a change to the way we're, to the title of the grades, but the original wording in our grade scale was along the lines of exceeds standard, proficient work, fair work, poor work, and failure. Um, talking as a team including teachers uh, we've decided that exceeds standard meets standard partially meets standard minimally meets standard and does not meet standard uh, is more in line mm -hmm. with our curriculum and how we are promoting our students and just to be clear that language was in the rest of the description mm -hmm. really just removing mm -hmm. those sort of value judgments from the beginning of the uh, state mm -hmm. Uh, the next section, what we are removing, is the Design Thinking Certificate and Global Competency Certificate. You might remember we introduced these several years back. 
um, as a way to bring in different pieces to our curriculum in our school for our students to access. Most of the materials that are in these certificates have been rolled into the courses at this stage. So um, design thinking certificate with the expansion of the makerspace, metalworking, design and fabrication, most of what they ask for in that are folded into the courses themselves now. Same with global competency uh, certificate as we've worked those materials, our original goal was to offer that and work those materials into the curriculum and we have now done that. Uh, the last one is one that we're very excited about and this is a, a change to a course but Latin 5, um, as you may remember there are three levels, there's AP Latin, Latin 5 Honors and Latin 5 Curriculum A. Uh, we are now going to be partnering with UMass Boston in much the same way we've done with Syracuse in the past. Uh, and we still have those programs with Syracuse as well. We call those SUPA. We'll be partnering with UMass Boston and students that complete Latin 5 uh, and pay the nominal fee will actually have a UMass Boston transcript that states that they've finished Latin 5. Uh, so we'll get credit through Arlington High School and they will get credit through UMass Boston. So we're very excited about that change and that connection with UMass. Any questions on the policy or general information? Any questions? I don't see any. So, do you want to tackle new courses? Or you want me to? You were doing great. I'll keep rolling. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I just want to say, Bill really pulls this all together, so I'm really perfectly happy for Bill to run through all of it. So, um, new courses. So, the new courses that we have, most of them are just advancing the curriculum we've already offered. Uh, filmmaking, architecture, animation. You'll remember last year we revamped mm -hmm. the visual arts department to take advantage of the new space. Mm -hmm. This is just taking those students that have finished part one and part two and opening up part three so they can continue their work. Um, design, engineering, and fabrication. We're really looking forward to this course where we are going to be doing uh, virtual designs and a change to this will be actually bringing them to the makerspace and designing and building the items whether that's in wood, metal, plastic with the 3D printers um, and we're hoping that will continue to grow. This is, starts at a level one, it does offer a level two right now and our hope is that in much the same way we do with the other art departments classes they'll continue to grow. Um, as far as the other courses, most of them actually previously existed. We are just finding new ways to, uh, as we did them this year, you'll notice courses like play building and directing um, and advanced scene study and improvisation are all courses we offered this year. As we taught through them, we decided that there are ways to meld these courses together and they actually fit well in terms of the curriculum. And so our goal there is to bring these courses together and really you know, play directing, uh, play building and directing are two courses that meld well and really build on the same skill set. Much the same way with improvisation and scene study. Um, let's see. There are several courses that are going to be put on the, uh, reactivated. Most of those focus around science and our computer science department. And like anything, we do rotate through these courses on a yearly basis. So as we De, uh, reactivate astronomy, we'll be deactivating weather and climate, um, we'll be reactivating artificial intelligence, which if any of you have walked through the building, you've seen the drone flying around. We have a student who is building an AI for a drone. It's a lot of fun, <laughs> a little scary at times. Um, and so though that, that rotation will continue on. Uh, there are several courses we're retiring. Most of those you'll see are actually just being enveloped by other courses. So we're not cutting back on anything, we're just finding new ways to have students access that material. And that is that. Did I miss anything? Very short process. Our goal, uh, next steps is obviously hear any questions, go through the process. Uh, our goal is to open up the course selection in February and then we'll have an idea of which courses will run and which courses will not run in March. And obviously that influences our staffing as well. And just because I feel I need to justify sitting here, um, I mean the philosophy by which we sort of create these new courses, right? There's 
new opportunities created by the new building. Um, there's new areas of interest um, expressed by students. And then sometimes we're looking to sort of serve or bring in populations of students. And then sometimes we're taking courses and sort of reconfiguring them to more accurately reflect what it is they're doing. So an example of bringing in new students, which wasn't mentioned, for example, is the pep band drum line, mm -hmm. right? Because we have a lot of students who are historically um, musicians, right? And they come up through the system, but there are kids who would like to learn to play a drum or might play other things. And so trying to create that opportunity, both to bring music into the community and bring another group of students into performing arts would just be one example. Any questions, comments, Mr. Shuffler? This is all very thoughtful. And, you know, having sat through this for a bunch of years, that I can see the logical progression in what you're doing. It makes a lot of sense. And I'm glad you're taking advantage <coughs> of the new building. <clears throat> the one thing I want to just sort of ask for a little more depth is the grade scale updates, because I think this is magnificent. I, I really, really admire you and like the change in wording. In conjunction with that, can you describe how teachers are rethinking their grading and how they're describing grading requirements to students? Because it would see, there, there, it seems there's a mind shift going on here. So we have been working for a while, right? If you go actually to the program of studies and look at the whole description of the grades, mm -hmm. um, the rest of the language, right, has been focusing on trying to have grades be more around three sort of core areas of standards, content knowledge, complex reasoning skills, and work habits. And by work habits, we mean scholarly behaviors. There's a lot of ways people talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of conversation about trying to make sure that your grades are aligning with those things. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we took out a long time ago was a lot of the qualitative things. Um, but to keep um, sort of consistent with how people used to be thinking about it, there was still this idea of good, fair, and poor. Mm -hmm. Right? And the more people have been talking about that, the more that never comes up. It's not really the way we're characterizing it. It's not fair work, it's students haven't met the standard yet. Mm -hmm. right? Which is the same kind of thinking when you say, it was it yet? When a student hasn't met the standard, it's not poor work, it's just mm -hmm. not yet. Right? And that's really the way we want things, more people to be thinking about it. And that's the conversation we're always having. So to go one step further in depth, I know that when, when I taught high school, which was sometime in the last century, uh, there was always this tendency of giving a bunch of grades, averaging it up, and using that to do the sort for the grade, so that an 82 would be a B minus, maybe, depending on the school. So that if you're talking about a standard that uh, if, if a child or a student doesn't encounter the standard when an assessment is made, earlier in the year, but then later on demonstrates meeting that standard, do we go back and adjust how we're grading the student, or does a, a earlier non-standard grade sort of hold in the mix somehow? You understand what I'm saying? No, I do understand. I mean, so what you were talking about, I mean, sort of philosophically, a sort of full standards-based approach mm -hmm. is sort of spiraling forward and will come back. Mm -hmm. There are various different ways to do that. Teacher practices right now are not idiosyncratic to the teachers, but they vary in terms of within grade alike classes, right? So everybody who's teaching biology is more aligned. There are some folks who are doing very full-fledged versions of standards-based. Mm -hmm. There are others who are doing more of what we just call standards reference. Mm -hmm. So you are making sure that you're referencing that the assignments are assessing those standards, that you're not simply saying, I gave you 100 pieces of equivalent work and then you did 80 of them and you got to be minus, mm -hmm. right? Instead, it's like if you're supposed to know how to speak, I've given you an opportunity to demonstrate that you know how to speak speeches. If you're supposed to write this sort of an essay, I've given you an opportunity to demonstrate that you're doing it at this level and an opportunity to make things up. So you'll see in a lot of classes, in a lot of math classes, um, there's a pretty standard of test retakes with corrections to make sure, because the other thing that used to happen in that way you were talking before, mm -hmm. Because I take a test, I don't get the grade, and I'm done. I never learn that thing. I move on to the next thing, mm -hmm. and I don't get the grade. Then. And the thing is, we want to make sure the students have learned it. So they take the test. If they don't master the content, 
there's a retake, there's an opportunity to make sure that the students have mastered the content. So I think that's a lot of what you're talking about. Exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm thinking about is that uh, if you do uh, end up uh, uh, playing nicely with, uh, with, with par uh, parallel transversals, say, where, where you didn't get it when the first time around, but you become an absolute master of it by the time you're done with the geometry course, that will be reflected in, uh, in, uh, in, in, your, in your grade and your assessment. Yeah. Mm, okay. okay. Other questions, comments? I'd like to hear more about the PEP band. I know you mentioned it briefly, but it was not <laughs> adequate for me. I would like to hear more about the PEP band. Um, I mean, the idea. I'm fine that, with hearing the idea. That's that also fine. If we get students who are interested, this, by the way, has been a 10 year journey for me. Um, we, have, we have made efforts at this in the past, but having sort of really the opportunity right now and staffing to do it. But the idea is that if we have students who are interested, um, it would particularly focus on uh, percussion. And um, I'm now going to not sound like a musician here. I do play all five chords on the guitar, so I got that. The instruments are all listed in yeah. the program of studies. Right. But the yeah. idea would be that it's focused mainly on percussion. The idea would be to learn how to do that sort of creating you know, an environment at games and other activities and programs. Um, awesome. And so um, as much as I love the symphony orchestra, they don't do well at football games. <laughs> Um, and so trying to have that spirit building both for students and that bringing the music into the space is something we're excited about. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No? Um, I think we need a motion to approve. Move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's unanimous approval of the Arlington High School Public Program of Studies. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Before I depart, I just wanted to say one quick thing. Uh, I told class council I would talk about this. The Winter Craft Market, January 26th, 5 to 7 at Arlington High School. We've got 10, 10 to 15 different groups. The student council organized this. We have 10, a diff 10 to 15 different artists and uh, uh, stores in the town that are going to be coming in. And so it'll be right in our cafeteria. So if anyone's interested, it's 5 to 7 right in the cafeteria tomorrow. Great. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have the panorama study results by Mr. Coleman. Should be the tab immediately to the left. Should be the tab is up there. That's no, on, on the, the computer. computer. Mm -hmm. Oh, gotcha. Thanks. Did you see it? It's like I got the, you now. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me back. Um, So this presentation, uh, just over the, the next uh, bunch of slides here, just to keep in mind, one of the things that we're working to do for this particular time is really give a 30,000 foot view of a lot of the results for the fall administration of the survey. Uh, overall success, and I'll talk about some of those little aspects of it. Just a quick little agenda, some of the bigger, broader topics that we'll be talking about. Uh, first, just wanted to talk about Panorama as a program. Uh, what is it? Uh, I'm not quite sure if we all have a, an understanding of, of where this survey tool has come about. Uh, we'll talk about some survey insights. Uh, and when we talk about those, just, again, 30,000 foot view, and there's going to be a lot of connections to the vision, the mission, and also the strategic plan. Uh, we'll talk about the reasons why, but we'll, we'll talk about those. And then at the end, we're going to talk about some of the action steps, um, not everything, and I'll, I'll discuss that throughout the presentation, uh, simply because of the fact that if this is connected to a lot of the strategic, strategic plan and the school improvement plans, a lot of this is also going to be, for, for my particular role, is supporting a lot of the buildings and making sure that they understand the implications of some of these uh, data uh, and understanding what uh, could be gleaned from there school improvement plans, and also uh, other, other things that we might find as areas of focus. So general quick little overview. 
Um, I put a couple of slides at the beginning. Uh, an important aspect when thinking about data is ensuring that we're, we're surveying and we're, we're finding data that's actually connected to things and characteristics that we valued. Uh, I, I don't want to be part of just giving surveys for the sake of being surveys. So uh, even the construction of the panorama survey for the multiple stakeholder groups has pretty clear connections. So in the vision statement, just bolded words and bolded phrases that are going to be a recurring theme and what we're going to be talking about. This idea of sense of belonging. There are aspects of the survey in which we talk about this. The idea of growth and joy. There are aspects of the survey we'll talk about this. This idea of empowerment and, and being engaged in your um, uh, content areas and curriculum, that's going to be part of what we'll talk about. When I first started off in supporting this administration, it was important to also sh uh, find connections to the strategic plan and work with different directors to find areas where their work tied to the survey results. Uh, these are three goals. I, I, by no means do I want to say that these are the only goals that uh, the panorama survey results could impact, but these were three in which they were highly impactful to many of the directors and, and a lot of the school improvement plans. And again, I just took the time to bold some of the words just as we're reading through. These are going to be recurring themes for what we'll try to look for inside of the survey results. Um, again, today is going to be a 30,000 foot view. Uh, not going to dig into any particular school, uh, but these are clear areas where when we're looking at the results and we're thinking about this story, this narrative that's being told, these are these characteristics and qualities in which we were able to see um, either growth or some areas of uh, improvement that we can go forward with. Um, one aspect, though, just because I always feel like this part's important to clarify, um, we do have the ability to sort in the panorama survey for different focal groups. An important aspect of that strategic plan was the uh, identification of certain focal groups where uh, we may have want to focus a little bit more. For today, we're not going to focus in on those, but I just wanted to t kind of talk about the fact that throughout my support, throughout some of the uh, session that we had had this uh, past week with administrators, uh, this idea of digging into a lot of the specifics, more of the questions, and also for some of our uh, groups of students in which we'd want to be a little bit more intentional, uh, that is part of what we've been working on. Uh, not to say it again, but today, 30,000 foot view. Uh, we won't get into a lot of the details, uh, but this is an important part in which uh, this survey can play a pretty important role to better understand uh, the experiences and the impacts our educational system has on uh, certain student groups. All right. I'm going to pivot now just to talk about this survey and talk about one of the reasons why um, for folks like myself and some of the other administrators, we, we see some value on this. Um, Panorama is an education-centered group. I've appreciated the team that I've worked with at Panorama. Uh, you know, I have an engineer that I work with directly. I have uh, other reps that really are supportive to the questions that I have. Like, honestly, they get back to me right away. Uh, they're open to all the weird queries and questions that I might have. They've really been good to work with. They understand the education setting. Uh, they know uh, areas that they need to improve a lot of the times before I even bring them up. Uh, and for myself, it's been great to work with them in this first time that I've been helping to support the administration. Um, they do have a, a, a pretty extensive suite of resources within their tools. It's been a pretty easy lift so far to get this off the ground. Uh, a lot of learning, but a good experience overall in working with them. The fact that they are so broad is great. Um, you know, I'll just quickly bring up a quick little conversation I had with uh, Dr. Janger this past week. You know, for him, when he's thinking about these results, sometimes it's hard for him to consider how these results compare to the elementary schools because the populations might be so different. But the fact that some of these questions and some of these groups of questions are nationally normed against a lot of other schools gives him other ways in which he can compare how we're doing. There's a lot of sortability and flexibility within the platform, uh, which I also appreciate this idea of just large numbers and other, other samples that may have um, better representations to the different groups that we're thinking about as well. So it's, it's been easy to work with. I feel pretty good about um, a lot of the aspects. Uh, doesn't mean that we've perfected it, but it's been pretty good to so far uh, for this administration. 
We have flexibilities in thinking about the types of questions that we ask, either individual questions or in groups of questions. Right now, the way we've set this up is in groups of questions. So for families, uh, those are the seven, eight, my eyes are going a little bad right now, seven, seven different categories. Uh, we actually ask all the categories that can be possibly asked for families. Uh, we've done that intentionally. Right now, we're still trying to get an understanding of, of, of a lot of different aspects across the board. Uh, we ask these questions, these groups of questions, to our grades 3 through 12 students. Uh, you'll see a little bit more, but just to kind of add on this detail right now, these questions are grouped by 3 through 5 similar questions, and then 6 through 12 similar questions. Right now, and this will, will be an important part towards the end, right now we ask questions of the students about the school and about the classroom. So when you think about these, these categories, they're, asking, they're answering based on their experiences with the school, asking, answering based on the experience with the classroom. We do have the ability to ask students about their experiences for themselves. We don't ask those students about themselves questions yet. Um, and we are thinking about what that might mean. And I'll talk a little about that towards the end. Um, for staff, this is the wonkiest one for us. Um, over the past two to three years, uh, because we've shifted some of the groups of questions, uh, and you'll see this in a little bit as well, we uh, panorama divided certain aspects of the grouping of the, the teachers and staff. Uh, we asked the fewest set of questions for staff. Um, these questions are relevant to what we're looking at, but because we have shifted so much over the past couple of years, it's really hard for us to look at trend data just because what we're asking has, has changed. So uh, you'll see in this presentation, I'm a pretty light on the info and staff. And that's not to mean that the info wasn't good. It's just that from a 30,000 foot view, it's been a little bit more of a challenge for us to get really clear takeaways. From the school level, in each of the buildings, they will. You know, it's gonna give them a little bit more information. But we just, um, we're in the position right now for staff, we just had a lot more variability in the way in which we structured it. Uh, our intention, though, is to keep, for the sake of trend and the sake of thinking about growth, um, our intention is to keep as much of this consistent for our spring administration with tweaks that are easy tweaks that are not going to impact what our overall results are uh, with the idea that uh, hopefully in future administrations we can get a little bit more of a consistent um, uh, view of this. All right. uh, I'm just going to put all three up. Um, we always have wins, so to speak. You know, I, I, there's a lot of good information to take away from the survey, but the one aspect that I was pretty psyched about is this was by far and away our most successful year if the metric was uh, participation. Uh, and I really have to thank a lot of folks for this. Uh, Wes and the communication team, the principals, just the ability to get this survey out there, just this ability to make sure it was available for all. Um, Oh, so many people did great work. Overall, out of the 11,000 people, students, family members, and staff that we surveyed, we had 62% respond, which was probably about 15 percentage points higher than at any point ever, uh, which was absolutely great. I think Dr. Holman said maybe 66% next time. We'll see if we can do that. Yeah, we'll see. So it's been great from that point of view. It makes me feel a lot more comfortable with the results, knowing the fact that it's just a higher volume. There were some years where, you know, and this is more towards the beginning, where we may have only had like 52 people respond in a certain category, and now it's on the scale of like, hey, 800 people responded in that. So it just makes us feel a little bit more comfortable and confident that we're getting a better canvas of, of how people feel. All right. So... This is one of the views. You probably saw little pieces of these types of reports cut up in, in different school improvement plans and presentations. I think we saw some of this today. This is just the trend for those different categories for our grade three through five students um, and where they were. Um, this doesn't give you the overall trend. It's just the prior administration, which for students was uh, last spring, spring 23. Uh, and um, yeah, this is how we did. I'm going to talk more detail in those in a little bit. Even though some look like they went down or some went up, there are different areas where, based on the overall trend, they're more interesting than others. 
Here's a snapshot of how grades 6 through 12 did. Um, one I do want to point out here, though, and we'll talk about this in more detail, is that for 6 through 12 students, the sense of, sense of belonging. I know that's been a recurring theme, and it was brought up a little bit in another uh, snapshot for a school. Uh, nice area of growth there. Family school relations. Uh, we'll talk about these results. I just wanted to point out one aspect on the, on the right. For the buckets on learning behavior and school safety, these were two core buckets when looked at in totality. Other questions we could look at if it's offered. That's the national benchmarking. So you can see, you know, learning behavior is fantastic. We went up one. But overall, compared to other districts nationally, we are still, I think the way it said was 11th percentile. Uh, school safety, same thing. We're not only getting our internal metrics, it went down two, but even with those scores, we're around the 50th percentile of, of all schools. So these reports are, are fantastic just to get a quick little sense, uh, but, you know, it warrants a lot more digging in. Uh, one last one. Oh, no, that was the last one. I alluded to it a little while ago. What we did this past Monday for two hours, and I'm grateful at the time for um, uh, Dr. Ford Walker to give up on an admin meeting, we were able to get a bunch of curriculum directors and a bunch of principals, and what we did was our first initial really deep dive into it, which really talked about how to navigate the, the survey platform, how to think about these reports, and it, um, you know, we were able to support them with different protocols where the hope is they're going to take these types of processes back to the ILTs, consider and reflect upon the school improvement plans, use this as a benchmark right now relative to, or uh, in respect to their goals that they've been created, and think about minor tweaks or little things that would have to shift for the remainder of the year to maybe see a little bit more of a positive impact that we're looking for. Um, so what I'm gonna do now to pivot is kind of just tell a story of, of the things that I noticed, um, things that, you know, I don't want to say seem contradictory at time, but just kind of talk through some of that, those, that high level data uh, in a quick little story. So here were different things. We have been focusing on the sense of belonging and it's improving. It's improving across the board. I've been very happy to see that. Uh, student family member perception though of cultural awareness and action is declining, which at first to me was a little anti-intuitive that belonging is increasing in a great way, but a certain aspect of where we might be focusing our, focusing our work didn't show growth. The teacher-student relationships at 6 through 12 is improving and remaining really steady. The perception of the school climate for students has been improving, but for family members, the perception of the school climate has been declining, uh, that's, uh, and that's been a little bit anti-intuitive. Uh, it's one of those things where it's, it's showing a little bit that students are feeling more positive about their experiences than families might be f uh, feeling about their students' experiences. Students' perception of rigorous expectations remains steady. In some areas, that's going up. And I'll talk about this, but not to, to bury the lead. The area of um, discourse was an area of growth for a lot of places uh, and, and improved here. But the family members' perceptions of the learning behaviors remain below expectations. That was that category where nationally we're around 11%, that's zero to 19%. So although we're showing improvement, there still might be, from a, the parent's point of view, areas of growth and improvement. And finally, this, this one, um, you know, I, I don't want to say that this is a main core reason, but, and I know a lot of the schools are, are talking about it, the idea that the family member's perception of the school-based communication might be changing a little bit, and it uh, has a little bit of a decline. So thinking about like, what's happening in some of these areas and thinking about um, where we might be able to improve. So let's dig into some of the data. <clears throat> One thing I did for each of these slides, if you look at the bottom, there are questions. I didn't want to include all the questions that are asked, but I included questions that seem to be pretty relevant to the impact on this data. So the sense of belonging, how well do people in uh, your school understand you as a person? How much do you matter to others? Uh, how connected do you feel? It's great to see that this is improving, um, and it's improving pretty consistently. For our grades 6 through 12 students, that's a fairly good increase. Um, I was psyched to see that. For our cultural awareness and action, uh, this is a chunking of all three, even the family members included. Um, although we are seeing that nice improvement, um, 
we have an area right now with the cultural awareness and some of the conversations that we could have here where I think we probably could have some areas of growth. Uh, talking about speaking out against racism. Um, little pockets, uh, and little uh, the PD uh, that uh, Margaret is working on uh, for Bishop, it's, those things are great. It's, it's awesome that those are already in place and those are moving forward uh, in order to keep these conversations going. This is for six through 12, thinking about the cultural awareness in action. A lot of these questions center on conversations on race. Um, how often are they having, in, uh, they, how often are they uh, occurring within schools? <clears throat> Teacher-student relationships, though, are improving. Uh, teachers being respectful towards you. Teachers are excited to have you again in the future. That interpersonal relationship, making sure you have a trusted adult, we're seeing a lot of signs of improvement here. This was that question on school climate. So we have this weird nuance where essentially students are feeling really good about their connections with the adults. We see here the perceptions of overall social learning in the school for the students is improving, but the parental pressure, the, the community perception of it, right now is showing a little bit of a dip. I did want to note though that it's still higher than the other two groups in terms of the favorable rating. But it's this weird nuance right now where it almost seems like there's a disconnect with how students feel about their school experience and how others might be perceiving it. This kind of added on to that in terms of the rigorous expectations. These two categories are really high relative uh, to a lot of other uh, samples. Uh, the area that was the biggest growth was the explaining the answers, the discourse portions of it. Uh, this has shown really, really steady growth with high overall scores the past few years, um, and this is pretty much the trend right now for 6 through 12. And again, this one seems like a really nice connection overall because we have, I know you've probably heard a lot of school improvement plans that are talking about the concept of discourse, talking about the concept of ensuring that students have voice, uh, and it's great to see that is being represented here. This is the learning behaviors. So although this is something that nationally is below, these were two core questions that were, were of, uh, of interest. How often does your child read for fun? And how motivated is your child to learn the topics covered in class? So I included this one because we, we are seeing growth, but it does feel like there's still a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, and these, these were the national uh, scores for that uh, learning behavior. So this one puts us near the 10th percentile. So again, we're seeing growth in those areas. Uh, that, that belief of, of how school um, is for our students uh, and our children, uh, but we definitely have some areas of growth. Mm -hmm. um, this one was a surprise. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time with this. This is the family school communication. Uh, specifically, just to kind of iron out this one, this is representative much more about how an individual school is working with their community. Uh, so right now, across the board, uh, for us as a district, where we're looking at a 30,000 foot view, it is decreasing a little bit. It's gone down. Uh, definitely an area in which we're going to dig into and try to understand. Um, uh, I know there's a lot of connections to school improvement plans, um, which, is, which is great, and hopefully some of this can be cleaned up a little bit. But this was, this was uh, one little area. I do want to note on this one that um, the area where we saw the biggest drop, the question we saw the biggest drop on was how clear we've been about COVID-related safety yes. measures and protocols, mm -hmm. which we don't really communicate about anymore. Hmm. So it's possible that with the removal of that, that question in that category at some yeah. point that this that could see fair. a nice little uptick again. Yep. Yeah. So right now, just in terms of how we're moving for the next step, and these are the type of things I appreciate Dr. Roman saying that, we've got to dig into this. You know, we're at the point right now where we have a pretty good sense of the overall data. This is just a big view. Uh, right now, there's uh, going to be resources put towards the principals to make sure that we're unpacking this at that school level. What does this mean for them? Um, for some of these schools, even though you see the downward trend, they're increasing by spades. Like, this isn't representative of how everyone's doing. It's just that bigger view. Um, ensuring that we're using this information as almost a benchmarking for, um, uh, for our school improvement plans. Uh, using the feedback from the administration. This is one of the things that I have been working on. I'm already gearing up for the spring administration. So for me, 
and I'm, I'm glad I didn't do this, but I almost wanted to send out a survey to ask how the survey went, uh, but that didn't seem like a good move. Uh, so I've been trying to get as much information about uh, how the survey experience was for different stakeholder groups, uh, little modifications ensuring we don't miss out on any teachers uh, for silly things. Uh, it's just wonky technical things, and we've been trying to do a lot of behind the scenes uh, work just to ensure that um, we're honoring everyone. And this includes also some question modifications. I think. Um, I was just I, explaining what that comment Yeah, the, I, I want to explain this in detail. I'm, I, I can't believe, I can't believe. <laughs> Uh, I'm old that there are teachers who work with us who were born after the year 2000. So we definitely missed uh, like a little area for demographic information for some of our staff. That's entirely on me. I'm old. We've already we're fixed it. Old. We already <laughs> fixed it for last time. So I apologize for that. Uh, so that, that, one's, that change is already made. Um, I, I described a little while ago, um, we, we do a lot of surveys. We, we do, in my short time in this role, it's amazing to me how much information that different departments and different groups collect data. Like we have a ton of stuff and being able to put this all together in a good uh, coherent place is, is part of a challenge. So um, the director of SEL has expressed interest in thinking about shifting some of the SEL surveys to be housed within Panorama. Remember at the beginning I talked about the idea of the student facing in information? So right now what we're trying to do in our uh, analysis of the overall structure of the survey system is to understand how we might be able to do that, if it's worth it to do that, and what it would mean. So right now we're, we're doing that, and that, that focus is, is going to be on the student. Uh, there are some bits of information and some things that we'd like to know a little bit more in detail. Uh, and Panoramic gives us that, uh, that ability, so just optimizing it as a platform is, is where we would be. Um, and the last little thing is, you know, for me, and this is the part of the work I like, is just working with all the other departments. You know, having a chance to, to sit down with Wes's department and think about what this might mean. Having a chance to sit down with Margaret's department and thinking about what this means. Those are going to be the, the, the little bits of work that we'll, we'll tackle over the next few months. Um, with that said, that kind of concludes my 30,000 foot overview. And I would love any questions. I'll do the best I can to answer them. Ms. Morgan. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess I'm going to go back to, so my sort of overall feedback is I think that this was super helpful um, and I'm just one of seven and like one of like, I don't know, know how many people are in this room, 15. I, in the future when we get this, I kind of probably need to go to like 15,000 feet. Okay. Uh, for me, like this, this was fine um, and uh, I think that like the 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 changes in you know the reported changes in each category is helpful and it because we sampled such a huge proportion of the population even these onesie twosie percentage deltas are like statistically significant i mean they are right like but like one and two like you can't I don't get super excited. Like, I, I'm kind of like, okay, yeah. neat. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, four, five, six, sure. Like, that That gets my interest. Um, so I guess that, but, and I don't know how you do that because I'm not interested. I'm, I don't want to be in the business of comparing schools or comparing elementary to middle to high because I think that that's an, I don't really know how you get to 15,000 feet. So good yeah. luck. Um, I, I can't, I don't, I don't like, but for me, what's, I'm, I'm interested in more of those sort of nuances. Um, and I think the work that you're doing, we saw it in the conversations that we had with um, the principals earlier, right? Because they were saying, oh, we're doing X, Y, and Z, and we're seeing this yep. result. So that may be where I get to my 15,000 yeah. feet. It may not be in something like this. Can I? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Just to respond to that, I agree with you 100%. The goal, the reason why I kept on saying about the 30,000 foot is this wasn't about making any inferences or judgments about any particular school at the moment. You know, it's, it really is, at this point, me making sure that they understand the impact for their school improvement plans. Um, to help with that, you know, it's, I could probably sit here for way too long. I think what was shared also were uh, some of these reports inside of uh, the system, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And these will allow you to go into a lot more detail in that. I was trying to find that balance between 
just giving us that overview, talking about where, what our next big core steps would be, where we were in this process of using this data, some takeaways. I, I will say this, I was leading the questions I chose for each of the categories, those were like the sixes. I wasn't choosing ones that were like ones or zeros. I was trying to give questions that either were in the positive or the negative that were impactful for that category. Just so all of you can kind of kind of that, here's a 30,000 foot, but here's a little inkling of, of why that may have changed. Yeah. So that was my, my splitting the difference. Which is, is great. And we're, I mean, we're going to, I assume, we're going to have a vote on Dr. Homan's goals later. I, I assume we're going to approve them. Um, but they speak a lot to some of the, the, the information that's going to be in here. Um, so I, uh, the, the staff participation seemed low to me at 61%. Like, yeah. what are we taking a percentage of? Like, is this of every human who gets a paycheck from it? Like, yeah. I, or uh, like, are, are we give anyway, um, I don't necessarily need an answer to that, but like, um, I hope we're giving them time to do it yep. um, and that we're able to, because um, 61 seems, a, it seems low to yep. me. Um, if, if we got 49% of, of families to do it, I, so that seems like there's an opportunity there. Um, what else did I have? Oh yeah, and then the COVID protocols questions <laughs> <laughs> probably probably um I, I i i found i was like whoa when i took it i was like yikes so um maybe we want to rethink those and then have we I, shared with panorama that those need to come out of those categories because they're in the category we can't take the question out without messing up the categorical right calculation so what dr home is alluding to is some of these questions come in a bulk like Neat. if you talk about school safety you get all the school safety. So these are the, the areas that when I'm working with them, thinking about the cost benefit. Like do you ask all of these for the sake that like 75% within that category are really good? Um, and it, how do you get rid of it? Sometimes you do have flexibilities to change things, but what you might lose is the nationally normed part of it because they're using some of the questions against each other. So you, you it's just, how you want to structure it. So those are the conversations that I'll be having and trying to understand like what what are the questions we really want to ask and what are the questions that we want to ask to ensure that we have that nationally norm data and all that other information. Great. And my last question is just around the experience of um, and I, I recognize my experience is sort of unique. I have a lot of children. Um, yeah. I have four of them. And my understanding is that I should fill this out four yeah. times, which um, I filled it out zero times um, because I just, like, I, I kind of couldn't get, I, I sort of thought I should do it, and then I couldn't get past, like, well, which of which is my favorite child who I'm going <laughs> to fill this <laughs> out for, right? Like, it was kind of like that, yeah. right? And then it's, so, I, and I don't know that there's any way to fix that, It's but it's tricky. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so, we talked about that. Um, I, you know, in working on this first administration, I received a lot of parent feedback. Mm -hmm. Some parents really wanted that ability to ask or answer for multiple students or children because they felt as though their kids were different and had very different experiences. Yeah. Some were annoyed that they had to fill it out that many times. So I intentionally didn't say just because I was more curious what people would do. I think we probably have to draw a line in the sand and say this is what we're going to do. For my first time through it, I didn't want to say do this because I was curious. Yeah. I was curious. There was a little bit of experimentation from my point of view because I want to understand, like, what is that feedback from the families? I do think, though, we're always going to have families who will want to respond multiple times. Agreed. I, and I think the other group is just the group that's confused. Like, yep. I, I got, like, confused. Yep. And then I was like, and that one, that's I've, on me. I've hit my, well, but is it, I mean, no, no, not really. I mean, I, cause I got an email from like multiple administrators <laughs> yeah. being like, this is your, so like, yeah. but it, it is, it's one of those things where like the activation barrier just like tips a little bit and then yeah. you kind of are like panic and then just don't like, do it. Don't do it. Um, but I mean, we have, four, so and the, the 49%, 46%, I can't remember. 49. The 49%. Is that like. That's the number of fam like that calculation. How, how pray tell did we good arrive question. at that number? For that one, I used the number of kids against the number of responses. So 3,100 or whatever, 40, whatever, how many students were in the overall versus the number of responses that we got back. 
So, but so it's probably a much higher percentage of families. Then. It could be. Oh, it definitely is could representative be. Yeah. of yeah. much yeah. more than half of our families yes. actually did more than I did, yeah. right? Did something, right? Mm -hmm. Like took some, like more than half of our families interacted with the survey in some way. Yes. Great. Can I, can I yeah. take 30 more seconds yeah. uh, to just say this? We do have also options. When we set up the staff survey, when we set up the student survey, we auto populate everything and then send them an individualized survey. So that is tailored to them. For families, we just create a link and they respond. So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence. In working with Panorama, you always get a higher response rate from families when the, it is guaranteed anonymous for that family one because th there's no record, it's, it's just a link. Yeah. You're just filling it out. So they, based on their experiences, we can set it up where we do the parent and it's sent directly to them to their email and that is their individual link, but there's a really big drop off with participation because of that fact. So you've got to kind of find that in between. Mm -hmm. So for, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. I, know. But, I mean, we use Pecan at my work yeah. and we all think that like HR is spying on us and like they promise us backwards and forwards. They're like, no, no, this is totally anonymous. And yeah. we're like, ah, oh, yeah, right. Um, yeah. And then we don't fill it out. But, and like, which, <laughs> I, I actually do believe it is yeah. probably like anonymous, right? But that there is that like, yeah, that I just sense. want to be very clear. We do not have data that tell right. that matches responses to human beings. We, so don't. we do yeah. not get that data. We do not want that data. Yeah. yeah. But we do roster the kids and the teachers. We don't roster or the families and, and just even to clarify this even though it's set up with a direct link for teachers and students there is no way to link the responses in the platform they actually intentionally do that but you can see the teachers who respond and who don't you can't see what their responses are you can never see that okay right, thank you so this is a follow-up because I I got questions from people yep. about, you know, how many am I supposed to fill out? You said you were curious, did you, look, like, if it's all that anonymized, did could we, what did you learn anything? What I learned is um, I don't think I'm going to satisfy everybody. So I'll draw a line, that, that's what I learned, and, I, and that's learning. So, I, you know, we may have to draw a line in the sand and say one per household, uh, and then we'll work through supporting those families who may want to do it more than once. Or we might just say, fill it out for as many times as you want and work through that. Um, yeah. Okay. I've just, yeah, no. It's... We could also roster and send an anonymized link. Well, that was my we other question is like, can you give people, a, like, yeah. can you, some of us don't care if, mm -hmm. like, we might be findable. Some of us care a lot. I don't know, like if there's, it, just to maximize Go it. Yeah, we can look into that. Who's next? Uh, thank you for this. Um, I have to try to read my notes. So, well, I was gonna say as another anecdote, um, I have two children at the same school, yeah. so I filled it out once because I felt <laughs> like other than the individual student experience, the communication I felt like was global. So when they're at different schools, I might feel differently about yeah. two different <laughs> responses. Yep. But anyway, um, so similar um, to Ms. Morgan and not being a statistician, my question is how do you, what of these changes are statistically significant and which is not? So um, I think it was like rigorous expectations. Was that the one that had a big drop off versus these ones that went up by one or two? Like how, how can you say, oh, look, we're doing better in this when it's uh, like an extra it, person answered the question? Yeah. A lot, this is also perception data. This is all how we feel about it. So even working with the principals and the directors the other day, we talked about the ladder of inference and, you know, thinking about notice and wonderings and thinking about uh, these takeaways and not having your biases come through and finding an answer right away and really exploring and looking for other sources of data. You know, it's... That triangulation, that ability to, 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 to lean into the inquiry as opposed to lean into the judgment. Um, I know this isn't 100% answering your question, but it really is a shift in the mindset. It really is thinking about this in more of a proactive kind of journey sort of way as opposed to this summative, this is how we did. And th that's what I've been trying to do in working with all of those folks 
is how do we use this data to inform what we're doing? So for some of the principals, it's already sparked some other questions. For some of them, you know, there was one particular principal who was like sites because their data clearly showed their, their strategic plan, one of their goals, it was directly related to a set of questions and it was a lot of positive growth. So really thinking about that as a metric that's showing at least a perception or some, some context that they're, they're showing growth. And then leaning into some others where we're like, oh, it may have been a dip, but what could be the cause for what those dips were? Um, and not like saying it was definitely this, but it could have been this, it could have been this. All right, so what, what could be a next possible action step? Does it mean we rewrite a goal, or does it mean we tweak the goal, or change the benchmark? Uh, that's, the, that's that habit that I'm hoping to instill on folks. So it sounds like it's sort of easier maybe to, <clears throat> to do this at a school level, which it, for it us is, and that's here at the yeah. committee is, is sort yeah. of too specific. Um, we want the overview, we want the general overview. But really, we should be looking at this at that school level. Mm -hmm. um, and then one other, just one other piece to this um, around sort of the, the context and the belonging and the cultural awareness and action and, all, and the school climate, I want to sort of, we're doing, we're, we're working on this and improving this in the mm -hmm. sort of intention that when students feel a sense of belonging and they have a positive school climate and teachers are happy to be at work, students are going to achieve at a higher yep. rate, right? That's where we're going with this. And so I guess another piece of this story that I would be interested in, in hearing in the future is h how does this match with, you know, what we're seeing very, uh, like lined up somehow, I don't know how you do this, with, with our achievement data. Like is, are we, are these things connected? I think the power of this survey lives in the longitudinal mm. analysis. We've focused a lot in our reporting, and Mr. Coleman focused a lot tonight, on belonging and rigorous expectations because we see those as mapping against achievement data. When we see steady improvement, even if it's 1% every year, every time we've administered since 2021, but that's steady in belonging, and that's improving. And we see a similar trend in rigorous expectations, and that's improving. And then we have an awesome accountability year like we did this year, mm -hmm. then our theory of action is working out, right? We're seeing that over time, as we focus on specific areas, do specific things at specific schools, where it is a little easier to trace, we did this and it did that. But system-wide, that longitudinal trend is, is very encouraging on particular areas where we've really been focusing our attention. What this survey is useful for, and why it's in my goals, is highlighting areas where we might be seeing a dip. Uh, we might be seeing a decline. The cultural awareness in action is a really interesting is. shift in how students are perceiving their experiences in school and how families are as well. And it's coming at a cultural time when it's there, there are things we can potentially think about and consider as contributors and contributing factors that may be beyond our locus of control or influence, or, but that are part of how we inter interact and engage with families every single day. So we need to think about new ways to do that. Um, and so that becomes a goal for the next year and a focus area, but we keep our laser focus on belonging, expectations, and keeping those high because we think those two things together help. Like if a student's held to high expectations, they know we believe they can achieve. And that helps them feel a sense of belonging and connection to their teachers, and that helps them achieve. And those three things together are having the impact that we want it to have. Yep, so we need some... Some image that puts that all that together. <laughs> cool. We'll work on that. I, I, we have to get okay. Leo for that. I, I'm not artistically inclined. Mr. Flipkin. Okay. Uh, I've got a bunch of stuff here, too. First of all, in, in pushing for belonging, you, you're talking about being able to tweak certain aspects of what's going on with uh, Panorama. I've got 120 families here whose language wasn't listed. Can we fix that? They, um, yes, so uh, do you want the, the quick answer to that? Yeah. Based on the questions that you choose internally for Panorama, uh -huh. they only offer, that's another one where it's a, it's, it's a if you, uh, I'm gonna make this up, if I choose this set of questions on school climate and internally they've only translated it for seven languages, mm -hmm. every time you choose a new thing, it changes the language that you offered. 
So we had pushed on them to keep offering more. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have it. Their response was, well, if you take out these, we can get it up to 15 languages. So it was one of those where, you know, based on what you ask, that's there. Their promise is that they're always translating and always offering in more languages. Uh, that one for this administration was less out of our, our control than I would have liked. I, I agree with you 100%. Can we get that, uh, that? That's a question directly. Question 11, what language do you mostly speak at home? Yeah. Uh, even if we can't translate it, because I, I know that we've got folks who, are multi, who, who speak a different language at home who are fluent enough in English to respond to the survey, but to not get yep. be able to represent them in the here is certainly really counter to our uh, belonging. I agree with you. I agree. And I think we're missing our biggest two languages in this district. That's my guess. I mean, you got 120 families here, 4% of the total. Um, on the plus one thing, um, plus one, I, you know, it could be 49.4 to 49.6, which by rounding goes from a 49 to a 50, and it's really not significant. Um, what I, you know, what I, what I'm interested in most, to tell you the truth, when I'm looking at the data, is in the order of magnitude of changes. Okay, here's our plus seven, here's our minus six, and obviously the ones who are out there are of interest. The ones that really didn't change, unless we're really going and trying to move that particular number, aren't as interesting as the ones that change. The other thing that I really, really need is the benchmark because without knowing what that national norm is, it's just a number floating in there. It's a 49% compared to 25% nationally, and we're, that 49% is, is really high, we're doing well compared to the rest of the world, or is the rest of the world at 80? Yeah. And anytime I see that number, I need that anchor. Um, uh, and so then my last follow-up question, because, you know, Ms. Morgan is really good, statistician has pushed a lot of good questions. And she also asked, are we giving time? And I think that's sort of the question, if for the staff surveys, that if we have employees that we're contracting time for, uh, and we say, hey guys, we're gonna give you an extra half hour off, go do whatever you want, but you have to have the survey done. Uh, that's sort of the way we did it in Lowell when I worked there and we got you know, huge numbers on the staff. Are we doing something like that, or can we do something like that? We did that. Uh, we did that. Yeah, so then it should that. be our expectation that we get so a higher number, staff, right? Staff, well, yes, and yes, this is all staff, and we don't, right, we have been focusing on making sure teaching staff fill out the survey. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's possible that some of those who did not or some of our operational staff mm -hmm. who qualify as staff in the survey, not as teachers. Mm -hmm. The other thing to note is that teachers who go to multiple schools or are assigned to multiple schools mm -hmm. show up at all of those schools in the stats <sighs> and so it's it's not 62 percent it's higher than that mm -hmm. in terms of staff who took the survey because if i'm at mm -hmm. gibbs and audison i'm going to take the survey at gibbs or audison mm -hmm. i'm not we're not going to ask staff to take it at every single school they hit especially if they are at multiple so that's it's a slightly deflated number because okay. of that can we get that is there some sort of way we can sort of figure out that number to get it accurate because if, if these guys are really going out and doing it and it's some sort of quirk in the way we're going about asking the question I'd like to recognize the fact that the teachers are really taking it seriously and giving us a good set of answers I lost my microphone we had 418 there's about 500 ish unit a members mm -hmm. maybe a little bit over that so that gives you a uh, some idea um, Time was given on the November 1st professional day to do this. Um, we had a cohort of elementary teachers who were doing EL training mm -hmm. all of that day, so they may not have gotten to it. Um, and for the non-teaching staff, um, remember we have paraprofessionals who don't have computers. Okay. Can we send a better message of, yeah, we, we, we care about you and this really is important because we want to make the world I better. sent reminders out for this in my weekly updates as well mm -hmm. to members. 
the comment I heard most from people was, I've been doing that for years and they've never listened to anything I've said on it, mm -hmm. so why am I going to keep wasting my time doing it? Okay. I think people have put a lot into their narrative comments, mm -hmm. which are never included in any of the reporting out that comes from it. And what they're seeing is, I keep telling people about concerns and issues and problems, and nobody's listening. So I was telling people this time, like, just fill out the numbers. I don't even care if you write anything. Just fill out the numbers. Um, so. That's interesting. Thanks. Okay. So for um, just in terms of the timeline, this year I think we did it a little later. We, we weren't able to get it for the November 1st. It was uh, later on at different staff meetings. I think for this year. I think it was. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do for the narrative is it was a little, yeah, I think it was a little later. That was on me. I didn't get it, it done was. in time. What did we do on November 1st? It was now, oh, yeah. it was ethics training. That's what yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and this is also true for the communication ones. And this, this one also is kind of the goal and the intentionality of, of trying to set up the survey. For the parents, a lot of the questions were centered, the narrative questions were centered on the idea of communication. The numerical values pretty much represent that. I believe, I have to look back at the core set of questions, um, the area that was important for staff this year, just connected to the, um, the strategic plan, centered on professional development and supports there. I uh, had a question also about cultural awareness, but that was also centered on PD. Um, we could definitely share out those narratives, but it was more, a lot of those comments were more centered on that for this year, just because that was that connection to the strategic, the strategic plan. One other, one other quick, uh, quick question, I'm not going to say quick question, I hate when people do that. Um, a, another panorama specific question, so that if you have multiple children like uh, Ms. Morgan, uh, and is there any way for the panorama survey to sort of, do you have another child in a district? If so, re, re, go back to question like logic. seven. Is there some way to do that in a yeah. recursive way? Good question. Yeah, I mean, I'll that, ask that, that, that is, I'm sure that that's something that's uh, vexing every district that's using it. Because if we then go and say, oh, if you have four children, just pick one, then, then what's going to happen is that people are going to, to go for the child they have something to say about. Yeah which is going to skew the numbers either high or low, depending on, on how they feel about that particular child's experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't asked them about the, that type of question or that type of setup. I'll ask them. Okay. Um. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so first, thank you for coming. We love to hear data. And, <laughs> and this position has worked out uh, great from my perspective because we're getting good presentations on data. We've got somebody who can aggregate the data and we can actually do something with it and, and not just let it sit on the shelf. So that's a great uh, improvement. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with Ms. Morgan a little bit that, I mean, you, you did present some of the trend data and we're sort of relying on you to pick out the things that you think are most interesting, yeah. but maybe a little bit more context, a little bit more of those um, those trend items or, or um, you know, for example, like school climate is discussed at in each of the surveys. But to look at that data, to compare like the different levels, you got to flip the pages, you know, and it's just hard to, to sort of see what's going on there. So a little bit more um, uh, data would be would be great. Um, uh, and then my question was about um, the uh, what was I going to ask about? Oh, so Dr. Holman mentioned the great improvement in belonging at um, at, at the Hardy. And, and I guess, are there other pops or declines that you saw, or is that for yeah. later analysis, or? It, it could be for later. Um, I'm, I fancy myself good with numbers. Yeah. I don't think I, I can, don't I don't think I can remember. I, I, I say this in all honesty, like uh, knowing I went through each of the schools individually, went through the districts. I, I don't recall each of them. Like I, no, I wasn't a, even trying to. But didn't have to answer your question, you were, didn't, yeah, didn't have time I mean, to include. But yeah, yeah, there were a lot of those. And yeah. like I kind of mentioned, what was important to me was putting folks in a position to start to think about this data mm -hmm. as benchmarking for a lot of their goals. I know, uh, Mr. Slickman, you were talking about kind of prioritizing them. The way I kind of worked with them in prioritizing them was more or less, 
all right, this is what you intended to do. These were your goals. What does that information tell you relative to that? Even if it's a zero or plus minus or whatever. And the second part was, have you learned anything else besides that? I think it was alluded to by Dr. Homan, like what might be good precursors to future goals or changes to goals. So I was using a little more of that as the way in which we uh, have a lens on this information. I, I just, I want intentionality. I want there to be, all right, this is what we're trying to do, and here's ways in which we can measure what that might be. Great, thank you. You're wrong. Can I just respond real quick? Yeah. To both, to Mr. Carton's go, point, go. to Mr. Coleman's point, and yeah. to Ms. Keyes' point. We've done more with this mid-year administration than we have at the mid-year administration ever. Yeah. And, and that includes getting leaders into the room to look at the data within a month of it coming back, uh, working on some reporting out to staff so that we can say, here's what you said, here's what we're doing, um, and putting it together with some other information that we have about what schools are doing, um, what I'm hearing from staff when I visit schools. So I, I think you know, yes, this has been a big capacity builder, having Mr. Coleman's role in place um, and having him in it. And we're really trying to get better about taking it in and then getting it back out to people to say, here's what we heard, here's what we're gonna do with it right now, here's what we are still working on, we're not quite sure exactly what we're gonna do with it yet, but you're gonna keep hearing about it um, because we've heard that feedback that you know, we do this, we don't quite know what the district does with it after we do it. So we're trying to get quicker on the turnaround. Okay, now I get a chance. <laughs> I actually, I'm not gonna, everyone's asked lots of good questions. I just had two kind of questions. Uh, one for the learning behaviors one. I just wonder if that's at all affected because we've been trying to decrease or eliminate homework at uh, the elementary school levels and so I, I know the kids are maybe supposed to be reading but that the homework was kind of what the parent saw in terms of learning learning behaviors right and if they're not doing it they don't have anything to really no. talk about and and so that's one question um, and you could Anyway, you, you can figure things out. Um, then the other thing is when you're doing, comparing to the national norms, I just like to have a better understanding of what, what the national, you know, what is the national norm and, and just, I, you know, I look on their website and they, they have names, but it doesn't tell me that all the schools in that district are doing it or, or just some sense of, you know, it's just this blob. I, I don't have any idea. You know, all I know is a blob with some names of school districts in it. I don't know are all the schools in that district represented or do they do all the questions, you know, anything like that. So those are... Those are kind of my questions. Um, and then in terms of the language ones, did I understand correctly that if they, if you wanna ask a question in that is not offered in a translated language, that then you can't, if it's one question that isn't offered in say Korean, then you can't offer any of the questions in Korean if you want to ask that question. Is that, is that what That's I understood? That's what was explained to me. So when we were... Can just have them skip that question so at least we get... <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. So I, I could ask. We, yeah. we don't get, you know, so we get no. some data and we understand what the data is versus getting nothing from yeah. people who speak Korean. The, just to talk through the way in which it works, it's like, all right, let's build your survey. You want this, you want this, and they've got the little, the little box, <clears throat> bucket with languages, and then you complete it. And then it is, based on your completed survey, this survey can be now be delivered in these languages. So I, I couldn't tell you which ones were the tipping point or which ones changed it. It's just that when we built the survey and we said this is what we want, uh, it came back that that survey is only available here. Uh, we went back and asked, can you have it in some more? Uh, they looked at it. I think there was a modification change, and, and then it increased the languages by one. So it wasn't a huge thing, but it was by no means... 
you know, I think it was in the, when all said and done, I think the number seven keep is in my mind. I think it may have only been available in like seven languages. It would have been better if it was available in a lot more. Um, I think we've talked <laughs> Mr. Coleman to death. That's right. So thank you very much. Clearly no we enjoy our data yeah. and discussing Thanks it. Thanks for having and me, everybody. Um, okay, so moving on, we have a uh, second read and vote for possible approval of the uh, school year 24-25 and 2526 and 2627 calendars and Dr. Holman you want to so adjustments um, adjustments as I understand it on the calendars are pretty minor we made sure that there were six all district early releases I think we adjusted the date on one of them um, Ms. Diggins can you remind me if there were any other adjustments to these Yep. Elementary. That was the only one. Okay. Yeah, there was a, yeah. We adjusted some conferences. Yep. So they weren't the week of um, the Thanksgiving the holiday yeah. break. Yep. Thanksgiving week. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my understanding had been that we wanted to get feedback before we approve uh, before Labor Day start on in the 2627 calendar yes and so we haven't gotten that feedback correct correct so, so are we only looking to approve the first two yes so okay. we have final for the first two in your materials and just the same file for 26 27 um, but it doesn't say final on it because we were anticipating you would vote those first two okay so okay. so does someone okay first well does someone want to make a motion to approve the 24, 25, and 25, 26 calendars, and? So moved. Second. Okay. And second. Um, and does anyone have any comments or questions about these? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, sorry. Uh, I said it in my head. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> any opposed? <laughs> any abstentions? Okay, so that passes unanimously, if quietly. <laughs> um, and next, we have the superintendent's goals for second read. Dr. Holman. Um, I, did, I only made a few changes in response to some feedback that I received from one of you at the last meeting to include a little bit um, more clarity about categories that come from the student survey so that people understand where that's, those are coming from. So I was explicit about um, being looking closely at the learning behaviors and student needs categories on the family surveys and some of the outcomes areas. Um, but for the most part, these are similar to what you had seen last time. Okay. Um, does someone want to make a motion to approve the superintendent's goals? So moved. Second. Uh, are there any further comments or questions about them? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's unanimous, thank you. Oh, actually, I shouldn't be, well, it's unanimous. It's unanimous versus us. unanimous. Yeah, yeah okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't, I can't see her from here. <laughs> I didn't realize she had stepped out. Um, okay, so next we have the superintendent's update. Okay, hold on. Catch him out there. Oh. Can you, um, Ms. Dickens, Ms. Morgan is actually on Zoom as an <laughs> attendee. No, she was, she was going to have to go out. I yeah, remember she this. Left, but she's no longer, I just put her on, she's on the Zoom through HCMI, but for the executive session, she couldn't actually be in there. But here she's, does she not want to be promoted? Is she, she not Zoom now? I just promoted oh, okay. her. Then we I have to go back and re-vote as a roll call. No, no, if it's, here she's come. Here she comes. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I didn't see when she. Oh, she should be in the panelist side. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There she. There we is. go. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So. Miss Morgan, can we hear you? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. 
I didn't realize you were on Zoom. Did you hear? We just took two votes. One was on the calendars, and the other was I'm on fine the with, I'm fine calls. with not being included, though. So okay. Do carry on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Update? Update. All right. So I have several for today. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of the volunteers and Amy Spear, who is chair of the Arlington High School Building Committee's Scub Committee for Communications. Um, we had AHS tours last Saturday on the 20th, and even though it was unbelievably cold outside, we had 2,000 people come, and most of them even ventured outside to check out the preschool, um, and were very excited about how beautiful it is, and some of them even ventured into our offices to see the school committee room. So we were really excited to welcome all of those community members, including lots of future students at the high school, into our tours. Um, everybody thought it, the space was just absolutely beautiful, very impressive work. Uh, by all of our teams that have contributed to the opening of phase two and it was a great success. Um, we are very pleased to have started a morning um, OMS bus run. I don't think it started yet actually I think it starts next week but we have uh, many families who are interested in this. It runs from East Arlington to Audison Middle School in the mornings only to alleviate some of the pressure on the MBTA uh, routes that have resulted in some students having trouble getting to school. Timing is good given the weather, what it is at this time of year, um, and we're looking into what we can do to meet some of the demand because we did have some pretty high demand for this bus. We ran a lottery um, randomly to determine who would have access to it and we're looking into the capacity of the run or whether we can do two. Uh, AHS Nordic Skiing um, update really quickly. They are having a wonderful season. There's a picture of them um, in action there at the bottom of your screen. This is, again, um, just as a reminder, the first year that this team has been up and running, and we've gotten some updates that they're having a wonderful season and are grateful for the school committee's support of this new team um, and that we were able to get it in place. A working, quick working groups update. We have 10 to 15 members per working group. Again, these are the strategic plan working groups. Um, they are led by members of our cabinet team and administration um, as facilitators, but they're sort of facilitator members. They work alongside members of the working group to implement small actions tied to the strategic plan in order to influence and inform um, actions that will come later and that will inform budget priorities for FY26. They're meeting two hours per month. They're conducting inquiry and action research cycles aligned to the initiatives. Um, there's a full member list that is in your materials and that I will also be publishing to the community in the February 1 newsletters to uh, staff and to families. We've had some members who, in retrospect, haven't been able to join. We've been adding new members in. Um, so there's a little bit of fluctuation happening, but we're really pleased to have added um, all of our members and had two meetings of the full groups in January to get a good head start. APS has been awarded, um, this is great news out of this week, we were awarded a Mass Save Climate Leader at the State House. Um, thank you to school mem committee members who were able to attend. Mr. Thielman, Mr. Schlickman, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Allison Ampey were there to accept the award with me. We're really pleased about this because it's been a lot of effort by building committees both for the Gibbs School and the Arlington High School as well as efforts that we've undertaken with the town to increase electric um, capacity and buses in town. So it's really an honor to be recognized alongside other municipalities and companies across the state as a climate leader. And we want to say a public thank you also to um, Talia, who was with us earlier, for the work that she's done um, spearheading some of our sustainability work in town. The LGBTQIA plus task force had a meeting this week on creative inclu creating inclusive learning environments. I want to say thank you to our panelists, um, AC, a fourth grade teacher at Brackett, Renee, a Pierce Elementary School librarian, Justin, a high school English teacher, and Jasper, an AHS junior, were all panelists at this event last night, sharing their perspectives and answering questions with the 20 or so community members who attended the forum in person at the high school. Also, these past couple of weeks, we celebrated Martin Luther, King birth, Martin Luther King's birthday. Um, the OMS eighth grade choir came on their day off that evening to um, sing a song that's inspired by Amanda Gorman's poem um, that she recited at uh, an inauguration. And the AHS Honors Orchestra Ensemble also performed um, works by an African-American uh, composer and artist. Uh, the MLK birthday celebration 
was fantastic. I don't know why it's in my update twice, but I thought it was worth mentioning <laughs> twice, clearly. Um, kindergarten registration is going to launch. Uh, our launch goal is February 1st. That is a launch goal. It may not be February 1st. We're working out the final details on that date. We have a brand new registration team, um, new staff running this effort, so it's their first time. We want to make sure that we have everything really ironed out and perfect in the forms before we launch them. We will be making sure that we message this um, a lot to all of our families so that they can let anybody who they know has a kindergartner coming in know that kindergarten has launched. We'll put it on the website. Um, we'll put it in our newsletters, and we will be sending uh, snail mail to all of the families that we know have an incoming kindergartner as well. Um, there will be extended Welcome Center service hours through the month of February, and we're looking to do visits at school sites, too, to make it easier for families to get to us if they need help with K registration um, or filling out any of that paperwork. And your enrollments are in your materials. I'll happily take any questions. Any questions? Mr. Schlichtman. I went to the LGBTQIA forum last night, and uh, Dr. Ford Walker also was there. Uh, she uh, offered welcoming remarks, and this was this was a spectacular event. This was really well done by uh, staff members and a student who were open and honest about their experiences with us, and uh, uh, you know, were personally revealing in their experiences both in life and in the Arlington Public Schools. And it was well worth uh, coming uh, coming out to to see. Um, and, and I think that the folks who participate in that need to be commended. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, next we have update. Okay. We now need to take a vote to acknowledge the town appropriation amount for the fiscal year of 2025. Um, can I, can someone make the motion that this is what we have to do every year to mm -hmm. satisfy whatever? Mm -hmm. I, I know Michael's not here. I was just checking and it's, it's off by a few thousand from what was in the last version of the long range plan that I have. I checked it and came up, actually, let's make sure this is the number that I thought we had. I, I had checked it and okay. thought it was okay. If you've checked it, then fine. Maybe and, I have it. This came it from checked? the deputy town manager directly this okay. week. Yeah, Great. it was the the uh, number of students was different. Okay. And so that made, and I checked that it worked out. So. Okay. Okay. So um, does someone want to make a motion to acknowledge? I, I move that we acknowledge the town <clears throat> appropriation listed. Second. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Schultzman. As always, it, this is the first step in that we're acknowledging the, the number, and I'm not worried that, it, that we might be off by a couple thousand because oftentimes something will happen uh, that, will, that will adjust that. Uh, recognizing the fact that we see this as a floor, not a ceiling. Okay. Anything else? Um, okay, so this will be a voice vote. Uh, Ms. Uh, we, we need roll call. I'm sorry, that's what I meant, roll okay. call. Mm -hmm. That's what, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Okay, Ms. Goodelson? Yes. Mr. Mm -hmm. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. And I also vote yes, so that's unanimous. Mm -hmm. Next we have the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of this item, of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item may be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 24181 dated 123-24 for $782,721.72. Arlington School Committee minutes of January 11th, 2024. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor, and this is a roll call vote. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Goodelson? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Schluckman? Yes. And I also vote yes. Now we have subcommittee and liaison reports. Uh, budget? Uh, we are meeting on Wednesday at 9 o'clock um, to go over um, the FY25 budget. Okay. Q 
Committee Relations? Nothing to report. Okay, we sent you a couple names for, uh, we need, we didn't, it, it should have happened and it did not. Okay. I will send them later. We, we, we approved them being sent to you last time. So. Okay. Um, Curriculum instruction accountability, Ms. Morgan? No report. No report. <laughs> okay. Uh, facilities? No report. Policy and procedure? We had an extensive meeting yesterday. Uh, I will I will have a whole bunch of stuff for first read uh, next meeting. A lot of that is either uh, some technical revisions to uh, gender neutralize some of our policies. The other is some technical changes to bring uh, policies up to current standards from MASC plus a couple more major policies so I will circulate a draft copy of the minutes and, and the uh, and the policies to the committee as soon as I get the uh, minutes done okay Arlington High School Building Committee work is on schedule and Dr. Holman talked about the great opening uh, day we had great tours we had uh, on Saturday and many thanks to all of the volunteers who helped out especially there was a great group of students that were really helpful yeah that's I know that there's been people to who want to us to have another one like every month or something mm -hmm. and I just wanted to point out that that event took a spear <clears throat> probably a week of man hours beforehand to plan plus a number of days in advance of that plus the time that the principals put into it and the administration plus all the volunteer time so mm -hmm. it's not something that we can just go bling, and, and it's we're not just opening the mm -hmm. doors of the school and saying here come on in we're opening it but in a way that we can keep the building safe mm -hmm. protected mm -hmm. and in good shape um, and to do that requires a lot more effort mm -hmm. than than I think people are aware of so yes I echo the thanks for the volunteers but also mm -hmm. oh and we are we'll have a tour a video tour of the new part of the high school up on the website very soon um, I know we've got the draft one coming through the communication subcommittee so if you missed the tour you can look for that and you can see some of the spaces and hear an explanation. Yeah, one, one thing I can add, if, you, if, any, if the public's interested to, for updates, you can just go to Arlington High School, ahsbuilding.org, and there's a blog, there's videos, there's mm -hmm. plenty of information to get updated on the project. <clears throat> um, liaison reports. Yep. Um, on Monday, January 29th, the Arlington Education Foundation will be hosting its annual innovation showcase at Punjab. Uh, Dr. Ford Walker will be the guest speaker. Uh, live music, small plates, cash bar, um, a suggested donation of $50, and you can register in advance at the AEF website, or you can stop by on Monday at Punjab, and I hope committee members will come. It's a really lovely evening. Okay. Um, any other ways on reports? Okay, I'm going to report on one. Um, the I attended with Dr. Holman a um, it's a video conference for the Influence mm -hmm. 100 run by the Center for Strategic Initiatives, um, which is a program that two of our um, employees are going through Ms. Pierre and Ms. Madame, Madame Fabienne Pierre Maxwell Pierre. yes mm -hmm. and um, so each quarter they have both the uh, enrollees and also the superintendent and a school committee member uh, is mm -hmm. it a chair or just a school committee member? A, a school committee member a school committee for us, member the chair. yeah um, attend the the conference and so there's people from Bedford and and where else Groton and a whole bunch of different towns um, and uh, so we attended this, this uh, a couple weeks ago and I just want to say it's really it's really an interesting thing they're talking about how to what they're trying to do is help improve the number of people of color in positions of authority in districts but also improve 
the experiences that the students and other staff were having, and they're trying to teach the the um, enrollees how to help make that happen and also influence, I think, the superintendent and the school mm -hmm. committee members. Um, and so I've attended, this, like, the second or third? I don't remember. I can't remember either. Yeah, anyway, so, um, and it's just, it's a really interesting program. I'm glad we're participating in it. And I wish there was something more with it that we could share out to the full school committee. I, I think, not to put them on the spot, Ms. Pierre's listening in, um, oh, that we yeah. could potentially <laughs> um, have them share a little bit about the experience at some point. Surprise. <laughs> um, but it is a program designed to increase the representation of people of color in the superintendency specifically. And so it is a superintendent building professional development opportunity, but it's also, as members of a cohort, they have the opportunity to do action research to influence the district itself uh, in its equity and racial equity efforts in particular. So um, it's a wonderful program that I've been part of. Uh, this is in now in my second district. It's supporting cohort members, and it's, uh, it's had an impact. A lot of people who have gone through the program have become assistant superintendents or superintendents or district leaders um, in other systems and are increasing the diversity of senior leadership in districts across the state. So yeah. I don't think we want to put Ms. Pierre on the spot this time we don't have to right now yeah we don't have to right now but I think yes it'd be nice to put that on the agenda and mm -hmm. at some point in the future so um, okay that was my liaison report any announcements okay future agenda items seeing none um, we are now going to go into executive session do we need to exit no okay so we will be exiting um, from executive session we're going in to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation <coughs> in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect collective bargaining may also be conducted and this is regarding the Arlington Education Unit A negotiations discussions. Um, so can I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, and this is a voice vote. Uh, Ms. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Gettleson? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. And I also vote yes. So we are now going into executive session and we will not be returning.